Thank you for downloading this podcast from the Forum for Philosophy. Subscribe for weekly discussions of science, culture, politics and the arts from a philosophical perspective. The Forum is a non-profit organisation and our events are free and open to all. You can support our work via our website and Facebook page. Good evening everyone, welcome to the LSE and welcome to this Forum for Philosophy event on the theme of war. Uh, supported by the LSE Center for Philosophy of Natural and Social Science and the Royal Institute of Philosophy. Now, war seems to be this inescapable fact about human lives. Any period in history, any part of the world, seems we can't get away from it. Human lives tarnished, destroyed by wars. There was a period, perhaps, around the end of the Cold War not that long ago when we thought we might be moving towards an era that was free of war, but now that hope seems to have receded. War seems to be just as much a fixture of human lives as it ever has been. This leads to some deep questions for philosophy, for the social sciences, and for history. Questions like, is war just, in some sense, part of human nature? Is it in our genes to have periods of peace, periods of war? Is it built into our psychology? These two questions about the ethics of war. Are there any circumstances in which a war is ever justified? Or are all wars in some sense immoral? What about killing individuals in the context of war? Does war create a special context in which people are actually justified in killing each other? Or is killing someone in war just as immoral as killing someone outside of war? And what does the future hold for human warfare? I mean, could it be that there are ways, there are things we can do to make wars less likely or to make them less devastating? Or is it perhaps inevitable that the wars of the future will be even more bloody and horrible than the wars of the past, particularly with the onset of AI and autonomous weapons? It's a real delight to be joined by four panelists who are coming to these questions from different disciplines, bringing different perspectives to bear on them. Uh, They are Suzanne Burry, uh, ethicist and philosopher here at the LSE, Michael Robillard from the University of Oxford, a uh, philosopher and also Iraq War veteran, former U.S. Ranger. Joe Mayalo from King's College London, professor of international history, specialist in the history of the two world wars. And Michael Muthukrishna, a cultural evolution theorist, economic psychologist uh, from here at LSE. To give you a sense of the format for the event, we'll talk among the panel about some of our key themes, and then at various points during the discussion, we'll go to you the audience to invite your comments and questions for the panel. So let's start with, uh, with you, Joe, and let's start with this first theme, this first key question. Is war part of human nature? I mean, has it, is it true what I said? Is it true that every period of human history, everywhere in the world, there's always war shaping human lives? Well, I think, I think you need to begin with, you know, what is war? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's certainly true, and the archaeological evidence would support it, that you can go all the way back to prehistory and you'll find evidence of violence. Uh, There's certainly uh, uh, plenty of historical evidence of the permanence of political violence, but you need to distinguish that, those, you know, uh, the broad category of violence, which is essential to understanding war, from war itself. You know, so, you know, uh, I think the way we understand war, at least since uh, the 18th, 19th century, is uh, 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 strategic political violence between mm. uh, organized violence between political communities. Yeah. Nation and, states? Well, I, I avoid the word state simply because, mm. uh, and apologies to anybody who's doing IR in this room, but I think IR tends to create this category of the state. It's better to use political communities or, or political units because we're, for most of history we're actually talking about empires, not states. Mm. And uh, in terms of this archaeological evidence, I mean there's some debate there, isn't there, right, but how, how do you distinguish evidence of war from evidence of just individuals murdering each other? Well, you can't. But what's interesting is that all attempts to try to do so are historically, need to be historically contextualized because uh, depending on, 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 on the period where this archaeology, uh, 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 these evacuations or, or uh, investigations are taking place, it tends to shape the way in which mm. war, you know, the past violence is, is read. Are we 
uh, it's, it's a huge generalization, but those who want war and see it as a good or as something that furthers human uh, advancement or progress will read into the past the permanence of war. I mean, is there, what do you think on this? Is there something about human psychology that just makes war unavoidable? No, because uh, uh, we avoid wars all the time. In fact, in, uh, what's striking about the summer of 1914 is just how much everybody wanted to avoid a big war. Uh, and I would say that's true in most of the, the, the you know, I'm, I'm in a, uh, my expertise lies in sort of late 19th and through the 20th century. And I'd say most of the time, in most places, most decision makers who wanted to avoid war. I mean, Michael, let's bring, uh, bring you in on this. I mean, from a cultural evolution theory point of view, this idea of conflict between groups really being a fixture of human history, yeah. human culture, is an important idea. No, absolutely. So if, if there are two kind of uh, characteristic features of our species, it's that we, we tend to cooperate with one another and we tend to compete with one another. And those are kind of two sides of the same coin, this, this conflict and this cooperation. And all that we see differences in is the scale at which it takes place. So, you know, it used to be families against families, then tribes against tribes, then, you know, princedoms against princedoms, nation states against nation states, and now we're seeing kind of uh, violence against between, between large civilizations, so religions or, you know, the, the Russian world versus the Chinese world versus uh, the Anglosphere, for example. Um, and so understanding the mechanisms that underlie each of these scales and how it is that they come into conflict with one another and how it is that we've managed to achieve these higher scales of cooperation where within that cooperative group there's much less violence is, I think, mm. crucial to understanding the, the decline of violence that we've seen. Oh, so you, you believe in this, this idea I associate with Stephen Pinker. Right? Oh, absolutely. De declining yeah. violence over recent history. Yeah, so, so I agree with, uh, with Stephen. I agree with you know, the kind of data that Max Roser has on Our World and Data that the, the amount of violence has declined that's, uh, everyone, don't panic. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I agree with Steve that, uh, the, that violence has been declining mm -hmm. and your probability of dying uh, due, to, due to someone else killing you has declined over time. Where I disagree with, with him is on the mechanism that under, underlies that. Uh -huh. And that mechanism is crucial because by his account, we're, you know, we're getting more intelligent about this. Um, we, you know, it's the ideas that are driving it, it's rationality and so on. And I don't think that's what's going on. I think it is this kind of what we call cultural group selection. And if that's true, what it means is that you're going to see this overall decline punctuated by these larger scale conflicts uh, because the scale of cooperation has gone up. And that's a very different prediction. Is, do you agree with this, Joe? Um, I have trouble with the idea that uh, um, war, uh, uh, certainly interstate war is on the decline. Mm -hmm. Although we may just be on the cusp of another point where that's about to change. Um, what is clear to me is that the, the capacity both in, in uh, so from the point of view of international politics or international law, interstate war uh, uh, was on the decline in the 19th century. It was a long period or two long periods of peace. And some would argue that the Cold War itself represented a long period of peace, which it ought to make everybody in the room puzzled because uh, the Cold War was anything but peaceful in terms of political violence, wars of decolonization, wars of national liberation. It's how you define, again, war and understand war that can bring into focus a lot of casualties that mm -hmm. I think, uh, uh, whether it's Mueller or Pinker, uh, uh, um, get lost in the calculation. So no, I don't, I don't, don't agree with mm -hmm. that. What is interesting is that there are long periods historically, where there's an absence of what you might call systemic wars, big wars between the biggest powers, which tend to be the most violent, the most destructive. Which periods were you thinking of? For, for the long periods of peace? Yeah. Oh, well, certainly 1815 mm. to the uh, 18, late 1840s, mm. and then 1870s to the eve of the First World War, 1912, 1913. Mm. And then I, I think there is something to the idea that the Cold War was a long period of peace if, you, if, you, if you're thinking in terms of the big powers with the, the, the major weapon systems. Yeah. So if you define war pretty narrowly, exactly. Cold War is a period of peace. Yes. Yeah. I mean, let's bring Suzanne on this. I mean, you've been looking very skeptical <laughs> amid, all this, amid all this discussion of Stephen Pinker and violence decreasing. 
I've heard before that whenever I'm thinking I look like I'm about to kill someone, so maybe <laughs> <laughs> I was actually just listening attentively. I don't know if I have much to add to what was said, but one of the questions that you said you would ask mm. these two guys was about, is it just part of human nature so that we will fight wars because we're partial? So we tend to be mm. more partial for, like, towards ourselves and then towards our own tribe. And here I think an interesting question is that from the point of view of ethics, it actually is a debate within ethics whether partiality might be justified. So some people think morality by its definition has to be impartial. So if you act morally, you will weigh everyone's interests equally. But at the same time, there's a huge debate and some people deny that. So they say it's actually part of human nature to be partial and morality would be too demanding if it demanded that you have to be completely impartial. So the idea is that according to many moral theories, some partiality is permitted and is actually part of the good life. But it wouldn't justify war because usually the thought is that the partiality ends um, with some sort of harm principle. So as soon as you threaten to harm other people, that's where you're no longer permitted to pursue your own projects by giving them more weight. So that was kind of like a thought I had when so I... So this idea of partiality resurfaces in the psychology literature, right? In oh, yeah. this idea of in-group, out-group distinctions, yeah. tribal instincts. Yeah. Is there something to I that? mean, I think, you know, the, the work on things like the minimal group paradigm uh, just shows how easy it is to trigger this in-groupishness, right? So for those of you who don't know, uh, you, can, you can categorize people into overestimators and underestimators arbitrarily or Klee lovers and Kandinsky lovers, and this leads to them going, you know, screw those Klee lovers, you know, <laughs> Kandinsky all the way. So you get this kind of, you know, in-group favoritism and this out-group discrimination. And the fact that it's so easy to trigger in these, these silly, silly ways, I think shows how deeply ingrained mm. that aspect of the psychology is. Now, whether that leads to you know, the kind of conflict that, that you know, we want to define as war, that's a separate issue. And I think that's to do with things like resource availability. I mean, certainly when we think of recent wars, it, it seems like ethnic identity, ethnic tension, preferring people of your group to people of, of other races, regarding other races even as, as sort of subhuman, seems to be an important theme. I mean, is that... Absolutely. So if you look at... Um, the period of uh, uh, what's often called the new imperialism from the 1870s all the way through into the uh, two world wars and, I would, and, and, and possibly beyond. Uh, this is the era of uh, 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 um, when international politics is infused with fundamentally racist ideas about hierarchy, mm -hmm. civilizations, civilization, civiliza civilizing missions, uh, um, and the need to somehow align uh, 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 political borders with um, uh, uh, um, ethnic, religious, uh, uh, racial, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and that is, and it's arguable that really the the, the nation state idea is, as as a concept, is most responsible for the political violence of the first half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. I mean, was that a new thing? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, 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 in, uh, sorry, the, the, the idea of the nation state as well, a concept. Well, the idea of war being driven by this strong beliefs about ethnic hierarchy, superiority. No, I think to, to so, you know, there, we have to distinguish between explanations for war, the causes of war, and then why, so why wars start, and why wars continue once they start, mm -hmm. and how, how do, how do you, how is it possible to mobilize people to kill each other? Mm. Uh, and I think this in-group, out-group, or differentiation, the, the sing, I think the most dangerous idea, period, in, in, certainly in my period of study, is the idea of a differentiated humanity. That, more than anything else, is, is, a, is a structural driver of violence. Uh, and it's important background for understanding war. So, Can I so, this? Yeah. It's just a small point from moral psychology. Mm. There's actually a finding that we almost, well, <laughs> almost never do something that's morally wrong under that description. So we, as humans, we always tend to tell ourselves a story of mm. why what we're doing isn't, for example, like purely selfish and I'm perfectly aware that I'm harming in an unjustified manner. But we first need a story where we somehow explain to ourselves why what we're doing is, is actually right. So I very much agree with that, like, the idea of ethnic superiority is extremely dangerous 
partly because it supplies that story and then we will readily or happily accept maybe almost any story that supports what we independently for some selfish reason maybe want to do and we will use that story to convince ourselves that what we're doing is somehow morally justified. And this very, very close relationship between sort of in-group hostility, uh, in-group cooperation and out-group hostility. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure why we do this, but certainly um, we have this tendency to, to homogenize the out-group and treat them as, you know, completely different to, to whatever our in-group is. And, of course, we recognize that there is a lot of uh, variance within the in-group, but it's still within the in-group. Um, why we do that, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, Michael, let's bring you in on this, I mean, particularly this thought of psychology of war. I mean, you experienced it yourself. Yeah, it's, it's got me thinking about William James's The Moral Equivalent of War that he wrote at the turn of the century prior to uh, both world wars. And his claim is something to the effect that there's something about the human condition that war brings out where there are what he referred to as the martial virtues that he thinks are valuable for the human condition, things like the capacity to demonstrate courage, the capacity to subsume one's own self-interests for the sake of the group, uh, to, to demonstrate uh, risk-taking behavior for, for some greater concept. And he, he pointed out that he thought that it, it's, it's tragic that war is, it, it requires or, or, or in, in the pursuit of, of justifying or, or vindicating those, those martial virtues, it, it requires often uh, crushing other, other civilizations or other, other political projects. So what James suggests is uh, trials against nature or, or vigorous sport or, or you know, something to, to function as a proxy to, to, to at least take that, that restlessness within... Uh, persons and direct it towards something that can, can vindicate the, the martial virtues without necessarily creating all, all the, mm. the negative uh, and often heinous consequences. Um, so I think that there's, there's something to that, and I, I don't think it's, there, it's at all inevitable that, that historical or evolutionary evidence suggests that, that war of the sort that James is worried about is inevitable. I think you can direct those types of energies towards uh, some proxy activity, hopefully. Mm. But th what I'd like to say, though, I, I don't think that means that the martial virtues are bad. I think that these are, are, are deep features of, of the human condition and that they ought to, to find productive expression as opposed to being tamped down or, or pretended that they don't exist. Yeah. I mean... Uh I was just thinking about that. Um, I think, you know, so there is this, the kind of psychology that we've been discussing so far uh, that, you know, the most humans share that, that's tamped down or, or, or strengthened in given given outlet in, in, you know, across time and, and across the world. But then there's also the theater in which it plays out and the circumstances that lead to it. So, you, can, you know, maybe you can redirect a lot of it uh, to sports or to these other, other spheres. But then there's, you know, there's things like the economic condition and economic development that, you know, we briefly mentioned in the green room. Um, that can make the probability of people losing these other outlets and resorting to war more likely. So, uh, you know, so we have we have a paper right now that we're working on. Uh, you know, one line from it is we're trying to understand the rise of the right wing, and we're trying to understand the rise of this kind of thing. And and one thing that might explain it is just kind of slowed economic growth. So, if the world is kind of positive sum and things are growing, then. Um, when somebody you know starts a successful pizza business or whatever, it's worth using all of those cultural evolutionary biases and just copying them. Mm -hmm. But if the pie is shrinking, it's like buses coming along. If there's plenty of buses coming along, you might complain about the fact that some people have favors with the bus company or you know different ethnicities. But if there's like one bus every hour or one a day, now suddenly it's get out of my way. I need this. <laughs> and so I think this the, the the economic the slowed economic growth that we've seen. Uh, I guess from the 70s, but also then, you know, more recently is, is partly responsible for the rise of the right wing in all these different places and the increased probability of war. So people are, are losing the outlets for, the, for that sort of psychological drive towards martial virtues. Yeah, maybe. Or, or it's also that, uh, I mean, that psychology is there. You can keep it under control for a long time in these other ways. But then there is kind of a reality of, for me and mine and my survival, 
Mm. Uh, and when that gets threatened, people act out. And if you have ways that they can act out, that's fine. But sometimes it's a very real, I need water and I've run out and I'm going to take the last class. I'm sorry, you know, Joe. Mm. <laughs> yeah. but my, my question is, what are martial virtues? What virtues are specifically martial? So James suggests that uh, courage, for instance, right? So in a, in a, in a uh, space where there, there's no likelihood of, of real risk, then the, the capacity to demonstrate courage, ne it never finds any possibility for expression. And he thinks that in terms of the human condition, in terms of character development, as well as, uh, you know, social cohesion or whatever, um, you know, subsuming individual uh, safety for the group that 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 just gets blunted. There's there's yeah. no possibility for that. So then, mm -hmm. yeah, you're left with, um, I guess, just a, a world of, of excessive comfort and docility. Yeah, can, yeah. <laughs> you can experience war vicariously through yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, but again, this 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 is you know uh, uh, um, historically an idea that needs to be contextualized in this contingent, sort of this idea that uh, uh, European society and broadly encompassing, including the United States, was somehow becoming soft and was decadent and in decline and that this, you know, and what was needed was a really good bust up to, to get things going, is, 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 a, is, again, a very late 19th century concept and idea, but, uh, which I, know, I don't think you'd disagree with that, but I'm, I'm you know, I wonder, um, I wonder how many of those virtues are really martial and how many of them are just virtues that we, you know, uh, 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 period. But the, mm -hmm. I'm not the ethicist in the room. Mm -hmm. I think his point is just they are virtues that find a useful expression in, in say, a just war, right. and mm -hmm. maybe their applications are rarer outside war. Is that the idea? Yeah. Of James? Yeah. Not of yeah. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. think the other, the other sort of canonical um, expression would be in... Um, uh, conquering of the wilderness and of, of some sort of western yes. frontier yes. in the absence of that now mm. now th there's less of a space by which those those virtues are relevant there's a risk of that the outlet being lost yeah something i mean it's so uh, we'll move on to the ethics of war in a, in a moment but first it'd be great to take a few questions from the audience on these themes of war and human nature the psychology of war i think this big problem that the panel has brought out here if we have this kind of in-group out-group psychology how do we manage that? How do we harness it to make war less likely rather than more likely? Great to take a few questions about this. Let's start in the second row here, and then we'll go back to the second row from the back. Um, I'll try to phrase this. Um, you spoke about, you think, a growth, lack of growth is, is potentially causing frustrations. But what about um, the concept of you know, lack of equality and if there's a, a problem, if you see, okay, it, it could be related to growth, but there's a, won't talk about that one now, but um, if you are trying to catch the bus and somebody else has got the fast car and yeah. so yeah. on, <laughs> doesn't that annoy people? Yeah, no, I, I think that's also the case. It's uh, where it's direct. So, you know, in the example that I gave, uh, you know, it's like, why are people giving favors to their own ethnicity? So I can mumble and grumble under conditions where there's another bus coming in five minutes, but I'm going to try to scramble my way. But it's also, you know, how come some people get special passes that get them to the front of the line that make it more difficult? And so that kind of anger, I think, rises up there. And it's just, it is the anger that we're seeing right now, isn't it? There's a question from the second row from the back, I think. Is that right? Yep. Please wait for the microphone to come to you so that we can hear the question. Apologies for the delay. Um, so yeah, I was wondering, um, isn't war actually, uh, I mean, inevitable in the sense that whatever happens, I feel like there's always a war that's created. Like, I mean, on, on each scale, we're always going to look for something. And I feel like it has this function of... Um, strengthening belonging, strengthening the sense of identity. And, well, I don't know what you think about that, but I think that whatever happens, there's always, I mean, saying that we want to eradicate war, for example, is, is absolutely impossible, and I wanted to have your thoughts about this. So, so the idea that war is a tool for 
uh, creating national cohesion or unity uh, uh, is a powerful one, and it's, again, another sort of mid-19th century uh, idea that uh, emerges from the critique of the German Empire by uh, left-wing socialist thinkers, Germans, uh, criticizing uh, uh, the, the, the new empire. Um, it, the, you can make the case, and there are those who do, but, per, but I think it's very difficult to see a war that was ever started on the basis of we need to create unity at home by, caught by, by violence abroad. Um, certainly, this was a standard explanation. It's, it's, the, uh, for, um, it's the standard explanation, um, the Fisherite explanation for the origins of the First World War, but it's, I, I, I think it's fundamentally wrong. It's not that those ideas uh, uh, um, weren't voiced or, or, or spoken by national leaders in the context of an international crisis, but it's never been a reason for going to war. Let's have uh, one more question, and then there'll be a further opportunity. That's again, second row from the back, just, uh, just, uh, yep. yep. Um, you know, having said that, war or this instinct to compete is inevitable. Do you think that in the future there will be, we'll be reduced to conflict that does not have violence, but like conflict as a way to express this competitive drive that we have, given that we are going towards positive sum economies? There's this wonderful Star Trek episode. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to think about war, watch, watch a bit of Star Trek. Uh, uh, where, where the, the enterprise comes across a civilization uh, uh, where, where two, two planets are, are at war with each other, but they've computerized everything. Mm -hmm. They calculate the casualties, and those who are designated casualties more or less have to, after 72 hours, surrender themselves to the They death. do get killed there. Mm -hmm. or the, or In so, that episode, they do get killed. Or they do get killed. <laughs> uh, 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 but it's this idea of, 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 of sort of, yeah, they do get killed, yes. But, <laughs> But of removing, removing the act of violence and making it almost voluntary somehow, if anything, it just, the, the, the basic idea was it made, made death a permanent, death due to war a permanent feature of that civilization. And that's, that's, that's I'm not sure that's, that is the future. <laughs> yeah. If I, might, if I might jump in, uh, you know, so when, so Pinker relies a lot on uh, Elias in orbit, and one of the reasons that he got kind of forgotten in history is because he wrote his book just before the, the World Wars broke out. Mm -hmm. And so I do worry that, you know, uh, Stephen's book is also a little bit like that. I'm not sure that we are moving toward, um, at least in the short term, positive some, uh, some economies, but we are seeing kind of proxies for war right now. So, you know, what's going on with... Uh, with hacking elections or, or cyber warfare is very much kind of a war that's happening behind the scenes and so far nobody's getting killed. Okay, well, more chance to uh, ask questions later on. For now, let's turn back to the panel and this second key topic of the ethics of war. I mean, let's start with, with Suzanne on that. It's particularly uh, an interest of yours. I mean, war is a horrible thing, right? Terrible, awful, absolutely never justified. Is that not right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so how should I end? Well, in a way, you're right. Like, if no one ever attacked anyone, then at least according to traditional just war theory, um, there wouldn't be a reason, in a way, to start the war. So traditional just war theory just argues, and I'm kind of on board with them, that the only justified wars are defensive wars against culpable aggression. So in some weird way, the answer is both yes and no, in the sense that if no one ever culpably attacked anyone, then there wouldn't be any justified wars. And in that sense, wars are always horrible because at least one of the two sides is unjustified, and at most one of the two sides is justified. So there can't be a war in which both sides are justified participating, only the defensive Does side. Does anyone argue that? I think no. No, I don't think I <laughs> so. So which side now? So there are where both sides are justified, no. Never happens. I mean, there is the idea that one side could be excused, so they would be unjustified, but they really wouldn't have any way of knowing that. So that's in principle feasible. That There are a lot of wars where it's yeah. sort of un unclear who is defending and who is ag aggressing, you know, if it's a dispute over a piece of disputed territory. I think Al Alsace-Lorraine would have been mm. sort of a canonical example of this as to, you know, what are, what are the justificatory reasons that, that warrants... Who, who's the aggressor and who's a, who's a defender. 
Um, so I think, yeah, certainly there, there are moments that are politically ambiguous, I suppose, but in aggregate, it, it would seem at least metaphysically, a, a lot of philosophers think it's metaphysically impossible to have a, a purely symmetrical level of justification. Mm. Well, I mean, so one important point is when I said that there can be a justified war if it's a defensive war against culpable aggression, but it's only a can. So even if you're justified in fighting back because your attacker was culpable, there's still rules about how you may fight back. And basically the most important, most important ones are necessity and proportionality. So even when you're culpably attacked, either as an individual or as a political community, um, harm has to be necessary as defensive harm, which means that if there is a less harmful way of fighting back and you choose the more harmful one, so you inflict unnecessary harm, then what you're doing is not justified. And the idea is that even if an attacker is culpable, if the harm that you in defense inflict is unnecessary, they might then have a right to fight back because what you inflict on them is independently unjustified. So did that make sense? So, it's, I mean, let's think about a real case. Right? I mean, would, is there an example of a war that, to you, you know, one side was justified? Well, so the standard example is World War II, and then the example would be, for example, the bombing of Dresden and other German towns. Mm. So even if the Allied response was justified as a response, there, were, there was sufficient cause to respond. Uh, basically, some of the elements of the Allied response would have been atrocities or would have been war crimes, and in that sense, then the Germans would have been permitted Mm. or justified in fighting back against it. So you're saying, you know, assuming no war crimes, the, the Allies were justified there because Germany attacked an Allied country. I mean, they were, they, they were justified in going all the way to Berlin, you know, were they just because Germany attacked Poland? Is that the... Well, I mean, I, th I think a lot of the justification would concern foreseeable harm were they not... Uh, put on the back foot and, and completely uh, defeated. Uh, so a lot of justification for war and not merely pushing things to a, a stalemate, but actually following through concerns foreseeable uh, existential risk, at least for the, the, the Western world, uh, if not further, as well as future deterrence value. So the idea being that uh, what can justify certain wars is future looking uh, considerations for w what what precedent that sets with respect to, to an international establishment of boundaries and, and what are uh, non-negotiable political uh, reasons. The justification can change during the war. Right? And it yes. starts off, you know, this was aggression against Poland, and then later it's now, you know, we have to set a precedent that fascism can't be allowed. Yeah, Alsace-Lorraine is one of these instances where you've, I mean, traditionally just war theorists see it as, as one side that baited the other and then lost the moral high ground, and then the moral high ground can, can shift throughout the, the continuity of a particular I mean, uh, can war. You, yeah. Can you just... Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask if you could describe the case that you're... you're um, can you help me out with this? I'm forgetting. <laughs> 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 yeah, it, uh, 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 the Franco-Prussian War, uh, um, um, uh, rather cleverly over uh, the succession of the Spanish crown, uh, uh, um, put France on the wrong side of uh, aggression. Um, but get, slightly different. Yeah. So after the First World War, uh, which was at the time and, and, and widely thought to be the war to end all wars, there was an attempt internationally to outlaw aggressive war and to, and if you follow that process, that international process, there are a couple of interesting things about it. One of which is, very quickly, um, no one could agree on aggression, what that actually meant in practice, right? And they kept coming up with unprovoked attack, uh, 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 you know, and, and, and uh, the other thing is that defining war and even defining peace becomes a power political object. So in disputes between the Soviet Union and the Western victors, it tended to be um, we are happy both to, in the, in the, from among the victors, to outlaw interstate conflict and civil unrest or revolt. Mm -hmm. Where the Soviet Union was also happy to, because they didn't want to be attacked, outlaw aggressive war, inter-imperial war, or imperialist war, but that wars of insurrection, civil wars, would be fine, because they mm -hmm. carried the revolution. So it's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. 
can mm. add two points. Yeah. So one of them, if we're talking about the Nazis, is, so I said the standardly justified war is a defensive war, but there's another justification that is more controversial, but it's another one for going to war, is if the state that you're going to war against is not respecting the human rights of its citizens, and it seems that the invasion of Poland was maybe in truth or like somewhat secondary to what made it justified, um, like what made the Allied response justified, it was also egregious human rights violations of one's own citizens, like even in, even in Germany. Justification in your sense can be different from what is the official justification. Right? It, I mean, no one was really talking about humanitarian grounds for, for war, as far as I know, but that could nevertheless still be the, the reason that justifies it. Well, like everything in ethics is, is controversial. So there's actually a rule about going to war that the just cause has to be your cause. And if it's not, so if you don't have the right intention, then the war is not actually justified. So I don't very much agree with that. I think if you have a just cause, but you're going to war for more self-interested reasons, I think the war would still be justified. It doesn't really depend mm. on like whose motives anyway. <laughs> but yeah. it is a debate whether you need to have the right intent and the standard idea is you do, and unless you have the right intention, right. you wouldn't be trusted. Mm. Okay. I mean, a lot of these issues surfaced with the Iraq war, if that's uh, not too recent an example to bring up. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, I, I consider myself a just war theorist, so I, I don't believe in political pacifism, I don't believe in political realism. I, I think that there can be a... Uh, a, a realistic middle space where it's not the case that all wars are always immoral, nor is it the case that it's just anything goes and there are no restrictions in terms of reasons to go for, to war or reasons uh, to uh, conduct oneself with ethical restraint in war. Uh, yeah, my time in uh, Baghdad in 2003, 2004, unsurprisingly, got me really thinking more carefully about what are the 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 epistemic and moral thresholds by which we can justify particular interventions and then how that translates down to the, the average soldier with respect to what yeah. are they responsible for. Um, and I, th I think by, by most accounts retrospectively, the, the, the Iraq war did not meet traditional um, standards for, for a just war that, that um, Suzanne mentioned. I mean, what's your view? I don't think it did, not at all. I mean, it, one might even suggest that we were the culpable aggressor in that instance. Does that mean the, the people fighting in Iraq defending were, were justified in fighting a war against us defensively? Um, yeah, I mean, to, to some, some extent, I suppose. I mean, a lot of the, uh, the justification for counter defense will be in, in virtue of what set of political reasons are you are you fighting um, I think there might be a difference between the metaphysical status of actually invading and then the metaphysical status of now once we we've, we've broken that area mm. is it best for people to, to allow for some type of governance to come in and stabilize as opposed to disrupt it and then fight a, a mm. Uh, a never-ending asymmetric war. war. So uh, I think we'd have to get into the details of what, what phase we're talking about. I mean, just to add to that, another condition that is necessary for you to be justified is a reasonable chance of success. I mean, you could call that part of the necessity condition, but basically, unless it's reasonable to expect that you will succeed, you're actually not permitted ah. in, in resisting as well. You're not permitted to defend yourself against overwhelming force. Well, so that's why this is controversial, yeah. but actually that's the idea, that if you cannot expect to be successful, something like heroic self-sacrifice or we would rather go down, that's actually not morally permissible, according to standard theories. Yeah. So we've got this case of the World War II allies versus Germany is maybe a, a paradigm case of a defensive war being justified, Iraq war not justified. I wanted to ask Joe about uh, America and Japan. Does the attack on Pearl Harbor by Japan justify a defensive war by America going all the way to dropping nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? 
Well, I think there are a lot of steps between yeah. uh, 7th December 1941 <laughs> and August. <laughs> a few things happened and, in between. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, um, well, what happened... You see, I, I think when we talk about the, the, the Second World War, and this is, this is, I'm writing a new book on the origins of the Second World War, and I'm trying to pull back from the picture of uh, uh, 3rd of September 1939 as being the start date of the war. Really, you have to see a long s breakdown in international politics that begins in the early 30s. Mm -hmm. And if you need a marker for the beginning of the Second World War, well, September uh, 1931, uh, the Japanese... Uh, uh, the Kwantung Army's invasion of Manchuria is, as, mm. is a pretty good starting place for where you have mm. one of the great powers that was a founding member of the international order is now breaking it quite explicitly. Mm. Um, was, so, but I'm not answering your question, which was about, uh, 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 you know, was the um, uh, 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 U.S.'s war in the Pacific justified? Almost certainly it was, right? Because, uh, uh, but it's, what's interesting is the way that the Japanese rationalized that war uh, and, and expanding the conflict in a way that was manifestly suicidal. I mean, this is, you know, they're not going to win this war. Uh, and they had no plan B for if, you know, the Americans don't surrender on the 9th of uh, December 1941, what, what, what happens, literally. Um, so, yes, the, you know, the, the Pacific War as it unfolded was, in my mind, certainly justified. Um, for the Japanese, it was about the economic strangulation of the empire and the demand that they leave China, which for them was more or less asking for a national surrender. Hmm. Okay. We can date that. That's the 26th of November, 1941, hmm. when the Secretary of State Hall presented the Japanese with basically those demands. Um, I, 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 it, it's a characteristic. I mean, the ethicists in the room will hmm. have more to say about this, but it's a, it seems to be that no party ever goes to war without feeling that they are the justified party and yeah. that they, are, uh, they have been attacked, if not attacked violently, uh, perhaps yeah. economically or in politically some other way, attacked. So every war feels like a defensive war Precisely. for every side, and then your job in a way is to try and work out who's right in retrospect. Yeah, well, we don't actually do that. We just stipulate under what conditions it would be right. We don't usually then <laughs> analyze <laughs> whether any particular war... Well, sometimes we do, but it's more about just saying if these conditions, you can tick them, mm -hmm. then a war is justified. And the actual disentanglement in a practical case, mm -hmm. usually philosophers are... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's, a, there's a deeper... <laughs> epistemic puzzle here, whereas if we're going to assume that there is an objective world and there are other, there are other persons, then uh, we can ostensibly conduct ourselves in, in ways by which we're, we're intersubjectively touching upon some sort of objective truths about the factual world and, and arguably the moral world. So it seems to me it's vacuously true that at any moment each individual does what they think is the best option because they thought there was another option, they would have done that one, which by definition would have been the best option for them. So, I mean, we're, we're always, in a sense, individually and politically, stuck within the circle of our own mind, as Aristotle put it. But at least the, the, the project of philosophy and at least the project of, of coordinating, coordinating ourselves within the social world is, is the uh, presupposition that there is another world and... and uh, there's an objective world that others can tap into, and we, we can ostensibly improve our, our epistemic perspective. Yeah. Can I have two points to this? Okay. Sorry, we don't have time. So it's about this idea that it's really hard to know who's the attacker. So two thoughts. One of them is in cases of individual self-defense, that's even harder, because basically if you're defending yourself against one person that's attacking you, you have to act before they have killed you. Uh, so defensive action is always you're anticipating harm. And that is really hard to work out what is sufficient because usually um, like once the person starts shooting, it's probably too late to defend yourself. And I think at least for something like political communities, usually there are already a couple of dead people. So 
in the individual case, it's actually even more of a puzzle. What are the objective conditions? And some people, including me, endorse something like a counterfactual account, which says that uh, you acted defensively if it's true that unless you would have acted, um, the other person would have harmed you. And then it's true that we just never know. We actually don't know the truth of counterfactuals. And the second thought I had, currently forgot it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So there's another um, element of what makes a war justified, and you have to declare it. And I think that tries to take care of that problem. So unless you declare your war, you actually didn't go to war in a justified way. And I think the idea here is precisely that. that say, but they declared it first, and then that was just a reaction. So I think that's why Which this is, is why a there's been no wars requirement. declared at least since 1945. <laughs> I mean, declaring, although interestingly enough, all the norms and rules of war always come into play in what are clearly wars, no one's ever actually declared, de declared war. Um, yeah. Uh, j just to put down, I would, I would never argue that there were no sort of objective uh, uh, ways of assessing or understanding uh, who's the aggressor, what, what, is, the, uh, 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 what is a morally good project uh, politically. But what I would say is that it's a common cause of war is this idea that both sides are somehow justified yeah. to go, uh, mm -hmm. uh, going to war. Yeah. I mean, can we zoom in on this? point about the individual soldier that Michael raised, you know, how these big picture considerations about whether the war is justified actually translate to the real kind of dilemmas on the ground faced by individuals about what an individual soldier is entitled to do. Yeah, the, uh, I mean, I think at least prior to, to World War I and World War II, the, you had the, the classic Tennyson line of uh, it's not ours to ask why, but, but to, to do or die. And, and at least the concept or the thought was that the, the business of deciding to go to war was, was not the concern of the soldier on the ground at all. And that one's duty, so to speak, was only to con contain their, their thoughts and their perspective to uh, the battlefield and conducting themselves in, in some sort of restrained way. I'm not sure if, that's, if things have changed, but the epistemic position of the average soldier nowadays with social media, with, with all, all sorts of various competing epistemic perspectives as to what is the, the justification for the, the political violence that they're taking part in, to my mind, it puts more of a burden now on the state to justify why it is exactly. Here, here are the clear spelled out reasons as to why uh, soldiers ought to be, to be fighting. And I think that that position that the, not just the average soldier, but the average citizen finds themselves in now, it, it, it warrants greater due diligence with respect to what it is people are participating in. I mean, are there, are there really rules in war, really? Or is it the case that there are all these rules in the, in the abstract and then you're actually on the ground and it all goes out the window? Um, I think as a feature of the human condition, I think there are, there are rules. I think if you look at any amount of, of data on, on PTSD or moral injury with soldiers, that even drone pilots, Experience, you know, they're, they're not at all in any physical risk, but they report tremendous instances of, of uh, moral injury and, and, and sense of a crisis of conscience with respect to, to some of the things that they're they're taking part in, and I think that at least speaks to some feature within the human condition where where we recognize at some level there's some basic dignity of of the the opponent mm. and. I mean, maybe that's just my romantic Western perspective, but I, I think that that's, think there's, there, uh, there's a there there. So do you think it's appropriate when sort of soldiers might subsequently be put on trial, held account for held to account for things they did in war, when civilians get killed and things like that? Can you repeat the question? Well, I mean, the question is whether these rules that apply to soldiers in war are such that once the war's over and peace is resumed, if they're found to have done something mm -hmm. terrible during the war, they, I, they, they shouldn't be excused. I think that there can be probably a lot of excusing conditions that the average 
uh, civilian taxpayer might not take into account, particularly with, with respect to time thresholds, competing pressures of trying to, to make a decision in uh, instances of, of, of radical uh, vagueness and, and the, the fog of war, the battle space. So, so those types of considerations, I think, can, in addition to just being worn down and placed in really a space where moral dilemmas are not only likely, they're inevitable in the long, on a long enough timeline. So I think that there's some principle of charity that we ought to uh, afford to soldiers in, in a, a lot of instances. Suzanne? Yeah, just to add to that, I think as I've talked about necessity and proportionality, this sounds like they provide good guidance. You shouldn't inflict harm unless it's necessary to achieve your goal. But once you actually start to think about what this means, it's extremely hard to know whether harm ever was necessary. And I think that's exactly a problem in war that these rules, um, given that you lack information about your alternatives or just about the situation in general, you have to make a judgment call, and oftentimes after the fact it turns out that the harm was maybe completely unnecessary. So in that sense, I think even if you have the best of intentions and you're fighting a justified war, you will find yourself in a situation where it turns out that you inflicted unnecessary harm, and you can tell yourself, well, but I couldn't have known better at the time and I had to act, but I think the moral injury in that sense is just inevitable because you will still feel that, well, as it turns out, I actually killed unnecessarily, and that must be a burden. Mm. When it comes to killing civilians, I mean, is, is that something, you mentioned the bombing of Dresden earlier on, is that something that is always wrong? But, I think we need to make a couple of distinctions here. One is whether or not it's, it's an intended targeting of civilians versus a foreseeable uh, side harming or, or collateral damage. Um, and then that needs to be weighed against what, what, what perspective good is supposed to be brought about by this particular option and, and were, were there other options. I mean, so we can imagine some hypothetical case where if we, we ratchet the, uh, the proportionality up high enough, we could say, okay, yeah, sure, if ticking time bomb that's going to blow up whatever all of Manhattan and you have to kill one civilian. You know, you know, so we can, we can run those types of, of hypotheticals. Um, most likely, though, in, in uh, real-world murky situations, I, I think the United States is, is probably very cognizant of trying to not harm or collaterally harm individual civilians. What they're not taking into account was whether or not second and third order <coughs> psychological effects of disrupting the social space, whether that should count as collateral harming. And I think that that's a big piece that's missing both ethically and strategically. Actually, just to add to that, I mean, it's true that traditionally that you have to distinguish between civilians uh, or non-combatants and combatants. That's been a really important principle. But at least in just war theory, this has come under attack. And a lot of um, ethicists actually argue that what matters is not, not so much whether you're a combatant or non-combatant, but whether you're culpable for an unjust war or non-culpable. And so the argument is like if you actually have people in the government that are clearly culpable for the unjust war, uh, or you could then kill a much less culpable unjust combatant, actually from an ethical point of view, you should go for the civilian. And I find that very intuitive, and you ask something like, are there rules of war? And I think you need to distinguish between like moral principles, I think necessity is one of them, and then something like heuristics that help you track the deep moral principles, and I think the principle of distinction, where you should only harm civilians collaterally, um, I think is more of a heuristic. It usually helps you um, maybe focus on culpable people more, but I think it's not a deep moral truth that there is a deep moral difference between a combatant and a non-combatant. Okay, it'd be great to take some questions from the audience on these issues relating to the justification of whole wars and also the conduct of individual soldiers in wars. Let's start in the second row here and then go back. So do you think if everybody had a say in who goes to war, uh, well, I'll rephrase the question, how would it affect the dynamics of war if everybody had a say in who went to it? Mm -hmm. Because you find that in most cases, people that decide who goes to war never take part 
directly in the war, and never in the battlefield, and never on the front lines. And if, you know, for example, if this whole room of the country and everybody, every one of us could potentially be a soldier at the front line, but we also had the decision of whether we went to war or not, how would that affect um, those dynamics of when people go to war? Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I mean, uh, nine years as an officer and uh, 11 years as an academic. And uh, I think a lot about Eisenhower's, Eisenhower's farewell speech, Beware the Military Industrial Complex, and what bearing that has had on the, the wars we have in, in, in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and, and, and these other rather adventurous and, and expeditionary uh, projects. And f at the end of Vietnam, we switched to a, to a ostensible all-volunteer force. But if you look at the, the recruitment data, it's, 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 it's very um, exploitative, I would argue, in terms of the, the persons that are, that are, that are ostensibly the 1% of the active military force or the 1% of the population that, it, that is being put into these, these situations and then having to, to be the the uh, bearer of, of all of these in bello and, and ad bellum tragedies or, or, or dirty hand scenarios. And the, the more and more I think about it in terms of the absence of oversight, in terms of the, the moral hazard of, of a forever war that never quite ends, and the, the danger of, of, of a radical civil military divide where you, ha you have a... a a warrior caste, and then everybody else, how far that can stretch. The more I think about it, I, I, I think some type of national service, some type of skin in the game would be the type of thing that, that could, could be most needed policy-wise to make it that we don't continue on this path of the, of the refrigerator hum forever war in the background. And I'm not sure what exactly that would look like. Maybe some type of national service where people aren't necessarily fighting, but some type of national service, maybe some type of war tax. I think minimally political leadership needs to lead. So if soldiers are downrange, you need political leadership that are, that are downrange with them. But skin in the game, I think that it's the only way at this point. Otherwise, I think we're inviting a moral hazard of, of this, the, the, uh, the forever war in the background. That's, that's it's a weird thing for me to say. Stanley McChrystal said the same thing, too, that you, people wouldn't expect that. But maybe going back to a draft, a pre-Vietnam uh, way of, of bring, bringing the civil and military worlds closer together, I think that might at least act as preventive medicine for, for these, these ongoing adventurous projects. There's a Can question I from... Um, uh, I think okay. just that it relates really interestingly to the first question we had. Mm -hmm. So her question was something about high like socioeconomic inequality could make people really angry and lead to war, but it also leads to war in the sense that we then just somehow provide some economic incentives to the weakest members of society and then make it worthwhile for them to fight our wars that we as the privileged would be unwilling to fight. And so if we were to reintroduce like a draft system where if as a society we decide to go to war, it can be any of us that has to go, I think that would be, like I agree with Michael, that basically this could be a way of actually avoiding many of the wars that are currently being fought. Let's take a question from the end of the row, about 10 rows back there. The very far end. Let's wait for the microphone to come to you. Thanks. Um, this ties in a bit into the question of having skin in the game, but I was wondering um, what you think the impacts of sort of potentially living in a, in a risk age or a risk society, as some people have described it, um, has had on policymaking in war. So, for example, um, I guess the reduced risk appetite for sending soldiers into conflict, but potentially a higher appetite for sending uh, drones in a more, well, in a way that's presented as more surgical. And if you could talk about the sort of interplay there. Sorry, my hearing's pretty bad. Could you, could you say that again, please? Yeah, basically, just the, um, the impact of living in a more sort of risk uh, obsessed society that's seen as uh, reducing the willingness in the public sort of discourse to send soldiers into direct harm, but actually one that sort of permits increased drone usage potentially and other ways of being more surgical with strikes. 
So just sort of the impact that that's had on how the public sees war and sees how acceptable it is that people um, use certain methods overseas. Okay. So I think, can I rephrase the question just to confirm? So it's something like, well, actually, thanks to new technologies, we all have a skin in the game. Like, even if you don't reintroduce the draft system, it, I mean, drones collaterally tend to kill civilians whenever they also hit a justified target, which they don't always do. Is that the idea? So given these new technologies, we might also become more averse to war once again because we cannot just outsource it to the weakest members of our society. Well, I guess yeah. the concern is we outsource it to the drones. Um, well, we'll, we'll come so, on so here, here's the, the, the issue that I have with that is that we don't outsource it to the drones. We outsource it to the drone pilots and we outsource it to the people that the one, not just the one percent, but a fraction of that one percent who are drone and reaper pilots that are the ones bearing the entirety of, of this, this uh, kill chain uh, and as well as being the, the ostensible bearers of, of dirty hands for the purposes of the shared demos and shared political project. So t to Suzanne's point, her, her claim was that... That was his question. Yeah, okay. Or point, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, let's yeah. take another, another yeah. question. Let's uh, go down to this uh, sixth row, I think, up oh, the end of that row. Yeah. Really think about that. Uh, yeah, I just, um, there was an article in the Telegraph which headlined, Inside the Parachute Regiment, the last outpost for hard men willing to do bad things to bad people. And then we have the British Army adverts which are trying to attract snowflakes and binge gamers. And sort of on the back of that last question, we always will likely need to be involved in some form of conflict, and especially in the Middle East, where we have quite an irrational and anonymous enemy. How are nation states and civilizations going to deal with um, interacting with these people? If we can't recruit the people, the foot soldiers, to go to war, how will we deal with this, or will we just turn a blind eye and... Um, let certain parts of the world just get on with it. I don't know if, what your, if your question, uh, uh, could you ask, what's the, what's the core of the question? <laughs> uh, just, uh, like, how do we deal with uh, people like ISIS? Mm -hmm. If we can't recruit soldiers to go out there with social media and awareness of risk, what do we do? How, how do we confront an enemy that hasn't expected? So the imperative that we, A, have to do something, that that has to be, sort of, you know, parachute regiment, Royal Marines right there, that somehow that there's this uncertainty that we'll find the right hard people to go out and do it. These, uh, uh, you know, for someone who's more or less devoted their life studying war, it's, these are, sound like, uh, um, uh, these are ideas that trouble me. What is, I mean, if, if you wanted a strategy for dealing with ISIS using local forces and uh, um, uh, wondering about that sort of chain of events that from two, you know, March 2003 onwards that, that creates the problem in the first place. So you have to wonder, I think there's a greater complexity to the whole thing than simply finding uh, the soldiers to fight wars of intervention abroad. You know, that background humming noise of the refrigerator it just perfectly describes the wars of imperial expansion in the 19th century. And that's, this is, you know, one of the critiques that can be made of a lot of the, quote, humanitarian interventions is that they are merely a, a reframing imperial intervention again in a way that morally justifies it. And this is troubling. Yeah, I mean, we'll take some more questions just before the end. Uh, I want to move on to our third topic. It's great that there are so many questions. Uh, but I... <laughs> I want to talk about our third topic, on the, which is the future of war, which you've already come on to. And this question of how modern technology is threatening to make war substantially worse, and perhaps more costly than ever. I mean, let's first of all think about nuclear weapons in this context. I mean, perhaps start with Joe. I mean, you've studied a war where nuclear weapons became decisive, and thankfully they've not been used in a war since. Is it inevitable that they will be? No, it's, it's sometimes, a, uh, not at all. It's sometimes a wonder that we actually got through the Cold War, uh, survived it without, I mean, there were accidents, of course. There were accidents at sea, uh, uh, accidents uh, in, the, in, the, in the polar regions. There are still missing weapons, um, you know, uh, in inaccessible places, I'm sure. 
why a computer glitch, why something didn't go wrong, and there are m multiple instances where it was close. So already creating the system, and that you know you might ask, is there, you know, what is the morality of building such a huge system of destruction, uh, 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 and the interaction between two military-industrial complexes, one in the east and one in the west, uh, was that moral? Was it sane? No, I don't think it's inevitable that we won't have the use of nuclear weapons. In fact, I would say that the North Korean Peninsula at the moment, uh, North Korea and the Korean Peninsula is the most dangerous hotspot in the world because of fundamental misunderstanding about what disarmament means on that peninsula. And, what the, uh, and it's yeah. very easy to, build, to create a scenario where nuclear weapons come into play. Um, I would say that one of the things that prolonged the peace between the superpowers during the um, uh, uh, long extended Cold War was the knowledge that nuclear weapons are simply more or less on a massive scale useless. The big weapons do not achieve the sort of strategic ends that war as we understand it is capable of, or it's at least thought to be capable of achieving. So it's in, it does inhibit war at that level. What do, you, why do you mean, what do you mean by that? The nuclear weapons don't help you achieve what it is well, achieve. Well, a massive exchange of nuclear weapons is, is the destruction of oh, so humanity the rather than... <laughs> I see. Right. But if it's asymmetric, I mean... If it's know. asymmetric, well, which is what it was in, in August 1945... Yeah. Um, then surely it does help you it, achieve... Achieve at certain ends, yes. Okay. Is disarmament necessary? I mean, is it, is it obligatory? I mean, it's a question for the ethicists. Should we morally be looking to disarm and nuclear weapons? I would say no. Morally speaking, we're just obliged not to use them. So, um, Is it no. a sustainable situation to have huge nuclear arsenals around the world not being used? Yeah. Well, do you want to say something about that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you use them strategically to actually increase overall safety in a probabilistic sense, and I mean this has to be about probabilities, um, I don't think it's obligatory to disarm. There could even be an obligation to remain armed if that's necessary to secure some sort of stability in um, what is necessarily not a perfectly stable system. That would be the short answer. Does that, does that factor in probabilities of people controlling those nuclear weapons always being yes. the same politicians that we, <laughs> that we enjoy today? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so if you're a very unstable politician, maybe you have a duty to disarm. Okay. <laughs> right, but that doesn't extend to the mentally stable ones that might actually do it. <laughs> well, Michael. I mean, I guess I'm just trying to parse out exactly what, what is realistic and, and what, is, what is predictable. What is it, somewhere around what, 200, 145 gets us a nuclear winner? Somewhere around there. Hmm. How many uh, nukes does Pakistan have? About that much. Right. So, um, the what are the predictability of, of, of various rational actors? I, I, I don't know. I mean, this is it's there. There are hard problems, and then there are there are in, intractable problems like this. And um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think I, I side with Suzanne for now. Um, in an ideal world, yeah, sure. You know, we, we, what, let's go back to um, trial by champions. We'll have David and Goliath so, solve our our, uh, our our conflicts. Wouldn't that be better? I mean, it, sure, yeah, it would. But we're we're not in that space. So how do we get from from here to there? Um, I'm I'm not um, Scott Sagan. I'm I'm not uh, Jeff McCausland. I'm not I'm not a nuke uh, policy expert. Um, so I, I would uh, probably side with Suzanne at this point, yeah, status quo. And the other big issue when people talk about the future of war is autonomous weapons, right, and AI and warfare, so-called killer robots. The idea that this situation we have now with remotely piloted drones, the next step is to just get rid of the pilots. I mean, is this, the, I mean, this is often talked about as a terrible thing, disastrous, wars will become so much more lethal, is that, do, you agree with, do you agree with this, uh, Michael, or is it, are there positives? I think that, I think that the, 
there's a danger with our conception of what an autonomous weapon is. I, d I don't think it raises to the level of an, of an emergent autonomous agent in, in, in a, a robust sense of agency or autonomy. If it did, by some magical emergent property, then we would have to regard it as having moral status. So having them fire wars for us or, having, or turning them off would, would constitute a, a consideration within our moral calculus. I don't think that autonomous weapons raise that level at all. I think rather it's the case that we have a lot of computational processes and the entailments are unpredictable and we have essentially become the magician who is now impressed with his own trick. And I think we, we I'll save getting into the, the nuances of machine learning and fill a mind, but I think that the greater danger right now is if we reify autonomous weapons to such a point where we think that they're, they're, they're these autonomous things cleaved from any responsibility of programmers, implementers, designers. Rather, I'd want to put those people on the hook yeah. just as much as any other. There's always going to be a human responsible, whether it's yeah. a programmer or, or what. Yeah. Mm. And Suzanne, do you want to come in on this? Is this... I mean, some people have argued, I think Elon Musk has argued for this, that there should be a total ban yeah. on any weapon that is outside human control. Yeah, okay. I don't agree with this. So um, people who argue for a total ban usually argue that there's something intrinsically wrong with using autonomous weapons, and I just don't see that argument. And then for me, what it boils down to is the question of will this technology... Um, if it's banned, which is different from saying that it doesn't come into existence, um, lead to less unjustified harm than if it's not banned, but regulated in some other sense. And I mean, maybe I'm super pragmatic or something, but it just seems to me banning it will not prevent its development, and hence it's better to regulate as opposed to ban, because you have more of an opportunity to maybe influence um, the harm profile so that there's less unjustified harm. And the people who are worried about intrinsic problems with autonomous weapons think something like um, that it's always wrong if the killing is outsourced to a machine and there's not a human being responsible for the killing. And here I just agree with Michael that I currently don't see for even the foreseeable future that there isn't a human being in the chain of command who can be held responsible for deploying the autonomous weapon in a certain context and hence being responsible for the killing that the machine performs. I mean, my understanding of folks like Elon uh, Musk rejecting autonomous weapons is not that it's wrong, it's just that it's intrinsically dangerous, that we lose control of who, who pulls the trigger, and that's a dangerous thing. And that's the reason to ban it rather than... I don't think he's, he's being the moral philosopher in this case. Interesting. So then I would just say don't ban but regulate because it's inevitable anyway. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, I guess just to circle back to my, my, my original point, I, I, I don't believe that there's such a thing as an autonomous weapon over and above the set of practices and institutions that, that uh, contribute to it. So I don't think that there's, there's anything magical about a plan, a human plan supervening on silicon or a human plan supervening on a, a set of um, institutions. So to that end, I don't. Th there's nothing there to ban. It's merely humans acting in certain coordinated ways. There's nothing else. There's nothing else there. Great. I mean, it'd be great now to take some of those questions from earlier on any of the topics we've discussed: war and human nature, ethics of war, future of war. Let's start from I think the sixth row back. What I'd like to do is just take three questions as a block, in the interests of time, and then we'll come back to the panel. So um, then go a few rows back. Um, hi. So my question is on culpability and morality. So um, there are two parts. So kind of like um, the first part, who, who do you actually blame exactly or seek compensation from um, for starting the war? So, I mean, in the past, you used to blame nations. And I mean, from the Nuremberg trials and from the Tokyo trials, you see that we are blaming individuals or like the war leaders. I mean, and I think um, someone mentioned about moral charity given to the soldiers. So, I mean, who exactly do you blame and to what extent is the compensation sort of morally sufficient? And the second part is um, when countries fight wars, the country that loses or surrenders is, I mean, they tend to be penalized, whereas the victors, I mean, 
the victors also, I mean, were involved in, in killing people and all, but they don't seem to be penalized. And I mean, this to me doesn't seem, I mean, the way this, I mean, the way the war is handled and dealt with doesn't seem really like morally justifiable to me. I don't know, like, how could you just penalize the war leaders of, for example, Japan and Germany and allow the allies to just go away scot-free like this? So I mean, what do you guys think? Mm, great. And let's go straight to another question from, I think, three rows back. Um, and then we'll go to the row behind that. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to challenge the, um, your reading of why drones or uh, autonomous weapons are morally problematic because I wouldn't say they're inherently problematic or that they're problematic in that they remove humans completely. But distinction kind of implies a symmetrical exposure to physical risk from the two sides. So you can't attack someone who has surrendered already, you can't attack civilians, you, you can't attack people who are not part of the machine that theoretically poses a threat to you. So when you decrease physical risk so much um, as you do with drones or semi-autonomous weapons or whatever, doesn't that fundamentally change the moral dynamics involved in the war? Great, and let's have a third question from the row directly behind. Hi, uh, hi, thank you. Uh, I was curious about, um, you know, I heard Suzanne talk about proportionality uh, in war, but I've heard some other theories that the, the most moral kind of war, the most ethical war, is one that is the most violent and the one that is the most unproportional. You know, go into somewhere very fast, do as much damage as you can, and then leave. Uh, what, what about that theory? Thanks, great. So three interesting questions. One about, you know, the units of blame and compensation in modern war. You know, who, what sort of things do we hold to, to blame, nations or something else? Question about the issue of asymmetric exposure to physical risk in the, the case of autonomous weapons. And also this case of whether, I suppose, whether the duration of the war is, is the crucial thing rather than its proportionality or something abstract like that. So thoughts from the panel on, on any of these three questions? I can spend 30 seconds on each, but because there's so many questions, I'll try to be brief. So the last one first, it reminds me of this idea like about how to rip off a Band-Aid, right? Like you can either do it very quickly or you can do it slowly. And it seems to me the overall goal should still be to minimize harm, right? And so if the strategy, as you describe it, of going in and kind of maximizing harm, if your idea is something like really scaring the enemy into them not fighting back and overall you actually minimize harm, then I'm with you, particularly because I think, like I said, that the distinction between civilians and combatants doesn't run as deep as has traditionally been upheld. So in principle, could be with you. The question on drones and pushing me on, or pushing us on the idea that maybe that's not inherently wrong, but somehow you need to be closer to the risk else the principle of distinction might not be upheld. I think to some extent, it's a psychological question, but there's a philosopher called Rob Sparrow, maybe you know the paper, and he argues precisely that, that unless, this goes back to Michael's point about the, the what's it called, the martial virtues, unless we're close enough to harm, we basically lose our ability to have a good sense of what proportionality means, what necessity means. So we cannot just outsource it to a machine because these kinds of things are like in an Aristotelian sense, practical wisdom, and you need to be at risk yourself to have a good sense of these principles of war. I think I don't agree. I think we currently don't have a good enough sense of what proportionality and necessity are all about. Well, it could mean that it gets even worse. And the first question, I thought it was a really difficult question, so I'm not sure I got it. But I think something you said was, how can we compensate after the fact if it turns out that individuals were blameworthy? And I think it's a very good point that for something like war crimes, compensation will just be um, probably impossible, but sometimes the argument is something like if you punish for war crimes, that's the closest you get to a compensation in the sense that at least something approaching justice will be done. And I think like after World War II, some of the hangings, you could say that is the closest the victims <clears throat> ever got to compensation. I guess, with, yeah, with respect to the, the second question, <coughs> uh, so I guess the argument being that with respect to sym symmetrical risk exposure, that, that there's something morally necessary about that. And, and I think we'd rather, that should, 
It should matter minimally if we consider that soldiers are fighting for a just cause. The just cause should be doing the thing that is the this doing the heavy lifty, lifting in terms of the moral justification for the action. And insofar as one has a technological advantage, then I think they're minimally justified, maybe even obligated to use it if it meant otherwise exposing soldiers unnecessarily, exposing them to unnecessary risk for the purposes of, of a just uh, end. So I think that that will be explaining how it is that you don't need mutual exposure of risk. Second of all, that's not, if, even if we accept that as a premise, that's not unique to drones at all. I mean, how far do we walk it back? Do we want to walk it back? No planes, no uh, projectile weaponry. We can only fight one another with knives. That's, that's the only instance where it, it's a just, just combat. Anything beyond that, it breaks that asymmetry. Um, and then lastly, as a factual point, um, drone pilots are, in fact, quite uh, put under a lot of risk, retrospectively. No, so psychological like risk? No, I mean in terms of the actual threat to them. Why is that? Well, if you think about it hard enough, then you can figure out how, how they might be under, under threat, maybe not at the exact moment, but maybe out of the fact. You mean if they're, if they're physically in the war zone and not... No, not physically in the war zone, but... Uh, revenge attacks. But yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. You know, you're still a person operating in the world, you know, um, same with special forces operators. You know, so, I mean, the, the thought that, that, the, the, that they're not bearing any physical risk, um, it's certainly there. It's just, it's, there's just a lag time. Mm -hmm. And I think people often forget that. Uh, on the third question about sort of, you know, uh, um, well, you know, shock and awe. <laughs> you know, all wars are meant to be, are planned and, you know, and meant to be engineered, you know, uh, if we achieve these aims in the first 30 days, we, we, we've won, we can declare victory. But one, one thing that is often missed in public discussions about going to war is that war is a dynamic. The enemy gets a vote. The enemy will fight back. The enemy even in an asymmetrical conflict, but particularly will find clever ways to get at you and prolong the conflict. And the inability to impose a victory, the inability to impose the immediate uh, achievement of destroying the enemy's forces uh, and turning that into some sort of political end, um, is, it's, it's an illusion that that's easy. Mm -hmm. Good. I mean, almost out of time. Just like to ask the panel one final question. I mean, we're not states. Uh, we're not leaders. We're not uh, nations. What can we do as individuals to make future wars less likely? Can I go last? <laughs> 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 what can we do as individuals to make future wars less likely? Um, gosh. The answer may be nothing. In which oh. case, that's a sad end to the event. Well, I mean, <laughs> with, at least at least within a, I mean, at least within a democracy, you have some choice over who you're voting for. Um, and you know, there's hawks and doves, and there's there's individuals who are more and less likely to take us to war. So I think at least you have some efficacy as a as a voting member of the public. So as the historian, uh, I, almost everything's been tried and has failed. So I'm not I'm not optimistic. Uh, individual action, uh, uh, transnational activism. Uh, uh, um, most wars tend to be caused by, or, or I'm, I'm, I don't want to overgeneralize, but it, doesn't, it seems to me that the structural factors, the big geopolitical movements, are what bring about conflict, and those are very difficult to ameliorate as individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, two thoughts, I guess. One is uh, probably just talk to soldiers and talk to veterans and try to break the these these weird cartoonish stereotypes of, of soldier as victim, soldier as villain, or soldier as, as lionized hero. I think if you, you talk to a lot of vets or soldiers, then you'll find that they're they're thinking about these these ideas and that their uh, their experiences are they're, they're rather complex and, re and rather nuanced. And so I think uh, di earnest dialogue, things like this. Uh, I think 22 push-ups for you know, veteran suicide, I think that type of stuff, it, it can be, it can come from a, a good, well-meaning place, but I don't know if it's the, it's the, it digs to the, the real institutional level of, 
of what we're trying to get at, and I just come back to what I really think policy-wise is, is skin in the game, is to hold your, uh, hold your political leaders accountable. Mm. Yeah, as an ethicist, I would say, um, think about how demanding it is for a war to be justified and hence how unlikely it is for any war to be or any side in any war to be justified. And basically don't support the war unless you think you have decisive reason to support it. That would be my mm. two cents. Thanks very much. Yes, there's some big problems here, big challenges, uh, but I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Let's uh, thank our panelists very much. <laughs>